Hi everyone, welcome back to another Pathophysiology video. This is Stephen and today I'll be talking to you about hydrocephalus. So in this video, we'll cover what is hydrocephalus, the symptoms of it, the pathophysiology behind it, and tips for the history taking and clinical examination. We'll also start and finish with some multiple choice questions, which we'll go into in more detail towards the end. So with these questions, just take a moment to pause the video and have a look and test yourself. But we'll cover the explanations behind them at the end of the video. So, now to start with what is hydrocephalus. So in its simplest terms, hydrocephalus is an accumulation of CSF in the ventricles, causing a dilatation of them as a result. There's two types, communicating and non-communicating. Communicating hydrocephalus is usually due to an infective pathology, while there is a mismatch of CSF production and reabsorption. So too much CSF is being made, and not enough of it is being removed, so you get a global dilatation of the ventricles. Non-communicating hydrocephalus is usually due to an obstruction, usually at the level of the cerebral aqueduct, causing dilatation of only the third and lateral ventricles. This is usually caused by some stenosis, brain tumours, haemorrhage or infarcts. And then to talk about idiopathic intracranial hypertension and normal pressure hydrocephalus. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension is often seen in young women who gain weight quickly. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is where the CT shows enlarged ventricles, but the CSF pressure on lumbar puncture is normal. Diagnosis of this is difficult, as it could just be due to cerebral atrophy relating to age. So, just to show a picture of the types, here's one I drew earlier. Here you've got the normal ventricles. Communicating hydrocephalus, so as you can see there's a global dilatation of all four ventricles. And non-communicating, where only the lateral and third ventricles are dilated. We'll discuss the pathophysiology and why they look like this further into the PowerPoint. So now to talk about the symptoms and signs. So in hydrocephalus, there's usually a headache, which is worse in the morning, or lying flat, and nausea and vomiting. Red flags for non-communicating hydrocephalus include occipital pain, neck stiffness and coma. And for idiopathic intracranial hypertension, there's often a transient headache, which is worse on cough and vision loss, especially with a change in posture. One big red flag is the presence of papillodema on the retina, because this is a very bad sign where the patient may be at risk of losing their sight. So relating to the pathophysiology of hydrocephalus, we'll start with communicating. In communicating, as we mentioned earlier, there's a global enlargement of the ventricles due to a mismatch between production and reabsorption of CSF. This is usually secondary to infections, such as meningitis, or bleeds, or venous sinus thrombosis. Non-communicating is usually caused by an obstruction. So as we said, tumours, aqueduct stenosis, or developmental abnormalities. The pathophysiology of idiopathic intracranial hypertension is unknown. Risks include obesity or recent weight gain, and being female in between the age of 15 to 45. In some cases, underlying causes such as venous sinus thrombosis or exogenous steroid use may be identified. So diagnosis. So do a CT scan and a lumbar puncture. Do a CT first to ensure that there's no risk of coning. So coning is the migration of the cerebellar tonsils into the foramen magnum, causing brainstem compression and therefore death. It must be avoided and therefore checked for. If the brain shifted due to the increased pressure in the ventricles, the lumbar puncture is contraindicated because it makes the shift worse and pulls the cerebellar tonsils down, causing the conan, and it's fatal. And in non-communicating hydrocephalus, this is a contraindication because the risk is too high. So talking to the clinical examination and history, ophthalmoscopy is extremely important. Test for vision loss in the peripheries or centrally in the cranial nerves exam. The history of hydrocephalus is that there's a headache that's worse in the morning than on lying flat, associated with nausea and vomiting, and they may have a recent infection, so a recent history of meningitis. For idiopathic intracranial hypertension, there may be recent rapid weight gain in a young female, which is one of the predisposing factors, as we mentioned before. Tips for the clinical examination. In a summary, 
take a very detailed history because it's necessary to determine the features of the headache because it could just be a different type of headache disorder as covered in the headaches video. Make sure you do ophthalmoscopy in suspected individuals with IIH. Do not miss papilledema. So again, to talk about papilledema, it's the swelling of the optic disc margins due to the increased pressure. And as a result, it can cause the patient to lose the sight. If we catch it early, we are able to treat it. But ultimately, always do the ophthalmoscopy if you suspect idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So now to return to the questions from the start of the video. Question 1. What is the normal route of CSF flow? So think of the overall route of flow, where the production starts and where it ultimately ends up. So the answer is A. So CSF is produced in the choroid plexus, which is located in the lateral ventricles. It then passes through the foramen of Monroe to the roof of the third ventricle, where it goes through the aqueduct of Sylvius to the posterior roof of the fourth ventricle, and then through the foramen of Magendi or Lushka, medially and laterally respectively, through the subarachnoid granulations, dural venous sinuses, and it's finally drained in the internal jugular vein. So think Magendi, medial, Lushka, lateral. So question two. What is the difference between communicating and non-communicating hydrocephalus? So the name of both types is a clue. So the answer is C. Communicating hydrocephalus causes dilatation of all four vessels, Non-communicating does not. So think it, the ventricles are communicating with one another. When there's global dilatation, all of them are enlarged because they're all communicating. Whereas when there's only slight dilatation in a couple of ventricles, they're not communicating. And then finally, question three. Idiopathic intracranial hypertension usually occurs in which group? So think of the commonest demographic to get IIH and the predisposing risk factors associated with it. So the answer is B, young females, aged between 15 to 45, and it's associated with obesity and rapid weight gain, though in most cases the cause is unclear. We just know that this is a predisposition. So thank you for watching, and that concludes the hydrocephalus video.